snowboarding was just coming onto the scene. Like it wasn't allowed yet in Canada um, at the time. So we, you know, we didn't have an option. You go skiing or you don't go. And um, we started making snowboards, you know, at school in the woodwork class. And we did that for a, a year or two before we were allowed to ride the chairlifts. And um, I actually made a decision to quit ski racing and, and to start snowboarding the year before they allowed snowboarding. Is ski racing is expensive and we spent years doing it and I was getting good at it. Like when you're 15 and you're doing something, you're good at something, right? Like junior hockey players are 15, right? Like it's a major thing to quit a sport that you're good at to do a sport that you're not allowed to do right and so at the time it was a big deal that i did that but um my dad drove us down to washington and we could snowboard at mount baker where we were allowed to snowboard and then the next year in 1988 they allowed snowboarding and so my dad started taking us to like different ski resorts that allowed snowboarding at the time you needed a snowboard license to even go snowboarding you had to show your picture id that you were a certified snowboarder and and uh they didn't really know how to deal with snowboarders like it was a new sport so anyways uh from my ski racing uh competitive nature i kind of got involved in competitive snowboarding right away um the next year in 89 i guess uh, i started on the amateur tour in bc started winning races and, and freestyle competitions right off the bat and um yeah I spent the next few years doing that you know made it to world cup spent six years on world cup boom olympics whammo gold medal ups and downs leading up uh to nagano um I was kind of at the end of my career because I'd already been competing for 10 years and I'd been living in Europe for six years at that point because I was on the World Cup tour. And, you know, isolated, no cell phones, no internet, right? This was pre-internet. So I'm really there by myself and just focused, right? And so there was lots of ups and downs as a Canadian athlete to try to find sponsorship because prior to Nagano, there, was, there were no national teams nothing like that, so it was all pro. So all of my sponsors were based in Europe. Like I had, you know, sponsored from Italian sunglass company and wax and Austrian snowboards and, you know, basically no one from Canada even knew what I was doing, right? And meanwhile, I'm on live TV in Europe and I'm like, my name is big in Europe and nobody even knows who I am in Canada. That all changed in 98, but so, Leading up to the games, like uh, like I said, I was ranked in the top three in the world, one, two, three, and three years consecutively. So I was like a major player leading into into the games. But then we had a huge shift with the association because the Snowboard Federation, once we got accepted to the Olympics, um, basically got shut down by the Ski Federation who wanted to take snowboarding themselves to the Olympics. And so they killed our association and then we had to quit our, our tours, which we were being paid to um, compete on. And so what they did, they started a different tour. And so all the guys that weren't in the top 20 on, the, on this, on the real tour, went over for a free ride around the world on the new tour. And now there was two world champions, there was two overall leaders. Of, and so it got political and there was like infighting, like, oh, you know, some guys went over and some guys didn't and like who did and who didn't. And like sponsors were like, we're going to drop you if you go over to the other tour. And so I held out right until the last minute, right? Like literally right up the year before the games. Um, before I switched tours because I was ranked in the top three and they were paying for my hotels and my rental cars and all my expenses to compete on this tour. Like I was making money, right? And um, I can't just like throw that all away. That's my whole entire career. But at the same time, we all wanted to go to the Olympics, right? And we were willing to sacrifice a lot basically to do that. And so there was like sponsorship battles leading up to the Olympics. There was politics. Um, and then of course, this new thing called drug testing that we'd never heard of before in, in snowboarding. And none of us were worried about it, um, except for the, you know, the weed, like we didn't know, like we we're asking like, so what's up with the weed, right? Like, 
We went to UBC, we're asking the doctors, they don't really know either like how long weed stays in your system. Like we're talking 1996, 1997, right? Like you have to go to the library still to look up stuff on weed, right? And so anyways, there was a lot of anxiety around that. Of course, I was a uh, cannabis user already prior, like way years and years before that. And so that was on my mind, especially because that was part of my like lifestyle, right? Like I'm like a non-drinker, a non-partier. I wake up early, athlete, you know, da, 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 the whole thing. Weed gets me, you know, this, the whole nine yards, right? That's my job. I talk about weed and why it's good for you, right? And so that was what I was worried about. Um, no good answers came from anybody. And so what we did was decided that April, in the springtime, like after the season, the spring of 97, we were gonna stop smoking weed and go through the whole summer with no weed, all the drug testing and get to the Olympics finally, and then smoke some joints right after the Olympics. But I went through that whole entire process and um, and we can get to it later. We can touch back onto it later, but there's there's a story behind my drug testing that led up to the Olympics. And then of course the infamous drug test there in Nagano, which I tested positive for, but you know, right before the Olympics, like I was, for example, there was a qualifying race in Whistler, like in December, right? For, for the Canadians. And they were using the World Cup race at Whistler as part of a Canadian qualification race for the Canadian team. So I did the World Cup race, I did pretty well in it. I did the Canadian qualification part of it as well. And, you know, I was in the top three in Canada. I was coming off a knee surgery, like an ACL knee surgery, like a year and a half before that. So I hadn't been, even though my points still put me in the top three, I was still kind of recovering from my knee surgery. So anyways, the next races for the Canadian athletes were in Banff, Alberta, where we were going to do three more races to decide who was going to be on the Canadian team. I decided to go to Europe and compete in the last two World Cup races with the guys I was going to be competing against at the Olympics because I'm ranked in the top three. Of course I'm going. I didn't even question whether I should do qualifications or not. Like I was like, forget that. Anyways, they, the airplane lost all my equipment on my way there. All my custom boards, my boots, my binding, my speed suits, like all my goggles, like I had tons of stuff, you know? And so I'm freaking out. We're in Switzerland, just at the Matterhorn in this little place called Graken and no gear at all, right? First day I get there, middle of the night, no gear at all. I don't know what to do. My coach calls me on the phone to the hotel, obviously, because there's no cell phones, to the hotel. And I'm like, hey, bud, what's up? Because he was in Banff doing the qualification races with the rest of the team. He goes, yeah, we did the qualification races. Uh, you tied for fourth. They're only taking four guys, and they're going to take the other guy because you didn't do the qualification races. Uh, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this guy's never beat me in a race ever in his life. Like, not even came close. Like he's a Canadian national competitor, but I'm, I'm an international, like I've won races on the World Cup for like blah, I'm the US Open champion, this and that, whatever. So we got a letter from my doctor where, because the race in Whistler that I did was in bad weather, right? And there's a lot of new snow. And so we got a letter from my doctor in Whistler saying that I had like a spiral fracture in my lower uh, tip fib from the bad snow conditions and that the extra couple of days traveling to Europe instead of instantly competing in these qualification races in Alberta gave me enough time to recover and be competitive at these races. I'm really sorry I didn't do the qualifications with you guys. Like, please let me on the team. But we didn't know the outcome yet. So I'm still trying to get this equipment like from the airlines to race and the two races literally three weeks before Nagano and so I got a board from a guy from France, from a sponsor that I used to ride for. Uh, it, Italy gave me a speed suit and bindings. I got a pair of race boots from a coach. Like they were ski boots even. I wasn't even in snowboard racing boots. Um, snowboard race boots look like ski boots. They're hard plastic in case you don't know. But um, anyways, they gave me the whole setup. Right? 
Some guys never make the top 20 in their whole fucking career ever. Like th their dream is to get in the top 15. So anyway, I got fourth place with all this weird gear that I had, right? Amazing. And then I go to the next race and, and uh, I was in Switzerland near, yeah, to Matterhorn. And then we went to Italy to do the second race and I got third place. I'm like, holy fuck, a fourth and a third right before the Olympics? Like that's two results that you'd be happy with for the whole entire season, right? Anyways, uh, so I went home after those two races, found out that I made the team and I grabbed out a board that I had that was just like the one that was lent to me, but it was made for me four years prior to the Olympics that I retired it. It was in my closet. I grabbed it out, mounted the bindings that they gave me, used the boots that the coach, like I kept everything the same. I did one run on black home, felt a hunt, like incredible. And then I flew to Calgary to meet the whole entire Canadian Olympic team the next day. So this is all happening in a matter of hours, right? So we get to Calgary, we get all our cool roots gear. We fly to Japan. Snowboarding is the first race of the Olympics in 1998. It was the first event of the whole entire Olympics, right? So we have one day to train and then we race the next morning. So we get to Japan, we go to sleep, wake up in the morning, we train, da -da 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 -da, go to sleep again, wake up and race. Just like that, and that that fast. So training the day before the race, I felt like never before. I never felt so good in all my races before, and it was incredible. One of my uh, uh, like friends on tour was like, "So how are you feeling?" Because everyone was like freaked out because we're all at the Olympics, right? There's guards with machine guns and shit. Like major Olympic stuff is going on, right? Like hard to comprehend as an athlete, like the difference between a World Cup event and an Olympic event. It's not the same thing at all. Anyways, I'm like, I'm feeling amazing. <laughs> like, I don't think anyone's gonna be able to beat me. I just don't see how it's possible, right? And I'm just like rolling into the Olympics feeling 100%. Like I just lost all my gear. I wasn't on the team. Now I'm there, boom, it's, everything's banging on all cylinders. And um, so yeah, I had a, a great, you know, I had a first run was, not the greatest that we did two runs combined time and um but it put me in a good start position for the second run because i was third i might i pulled three that was my number for the olympics and nobody likes to start at the front like that because the snow has still not been scraped off it's not as fast as if you start 10th or 15th right so i i finished top, i finished eighth in my first run which meant i got to start eighth in my second run which is perfect Except a big storm rolled in. It went from blue sky to like crazy storm, but I was used to it because that's like competing in, or living in Whistler is always like that, right? And um, anyways, it was just crazy. My coach wanted to give me a course report and let me know what the other guys were, what they were doing. And I said, no, I don't need to know that. What time are the award ceremonies? Like, I was just like, just, we already did training. I've been doing this since I was 15 years old. Like, there's nothing you can tell me now that's gonna help me, like, seriously. Like, it's over, right? We did it already. This run of my life, a ridiculously close time. I think I won by two hundredths of a second or something like that. And um, did the drug test right in the arena. Like, there's an army tent and it was inside the finish line and like thousands of people watching. And so we did our little like quick winner ceremony before the official medal ceremony. So right at the bottom, we had a little podium and then we did our drug test in the army tent. And then we got shuttled down to Nagano from there to do our uh, medal, um, to receive our medals. And uh, yeah, it was, it was nuts like nike was right there in the finish line right and they're like oh this is incredible because they remember i had come to nike headquarters in oregon because i was driving through there to, to train at mount hood in oregon in the fall like in september right so this is february and in september i drove through and i went to see the team manager because nike sponsored the canadian team this is where they make the air jordans and everything like they have the glass basketball court and everything and um 
I just walked in there. I'm like, hey, so and so, like, this is crazy, but I'm just driving past and I've had this feeling before, before huge events. And I've won these big events when I've had this feeling before. And I just want to come in here because it's crazy and just call it. I'm just gonna fucking say it. Like, I feel like I'm gonna win the Olympics in Nagano. Anyways, they were in the finish line, right? Blown away. They couldn't even believe it. Unbelievable. Like, they came with me down to Nagano in the little, like, van and shit. And Trans World Snowboard Magazine was with me in the little van. We did a big, huge interview. And, um, right? And then the award ceremonies were there. We finally got our medals, and I got my gold medal. And it was basically good to go. We were going from one building where we got the had their award ceremonies and we had to cross the street into another building like a hotel lobby and it was a red carpet with um you know the red velvet thing to guide the athletes through and the fans were on the sides right and some guy reaches out and grabs my medal and tries to yank it off my neck like from the middle of the crowd right and so i'm people are screaming i grab my medal i'm like holding it this is like one minute after I got it, right? So I'm walking into the hotel, it was like a big kerfuffle. There was the security all looking around, like what happened and everything. And so we went up, we went back to the ski resort, we partied, crazy party that night. And um, we were partying in the morning still when the coaches came in my room and told everybody to get out. And for me to like, probably I should sit down. And that's when they told me I had tested positive for something but they didn't know what it was yet and um yeah it was just like a crazy three weeks that you can't even imagine like you know you know i had to go down to nagano by myself in a two-hour bus ride like fully knowing like i know that it's weed because i don't do steroids or any drugs or anything like that right and it could only be weed but the thing is i did three drug tests in canada right before I got to the Olympics. And no news is good news, right? I didn't hear anything about it. Obviously I made the team and obviously I competed. But after the story broke, they released those test results and I had tested positive for weed in all of them. And I'm like, what, how is that even possible, right? So now here I am, I've lost my medal. They've literally already taken it away from me. And I, I make an appeal, I do two appeals to the IOC, like 35 members of the IOC all wearing their like traditional shit. I'm like, yeah, I smoke weed and they don't get this, right? Cause this is 1998. They think I'm talking about heroin or crack or something. And I stopped smoking it so we could meet the criteria for the Olympics. And I was hanging around all my friends still. And I thought that it was cool, but I was getting secondhand smoke. And so anyways, they didn't believe me. And I had to do another appeal, which I just repeated the story again and they didn't go for it. So I lost the first two appeals and then I went to the court of arbitration um, where the I had three lawyers sitting at the table and I was just, it was at a wine and cheese party with Prince Albert of Monaco and all these other like wild IOC members. Like I'm just, they're all, we support you. This is fucking bullshit. We shouldn't even be on the list or whatever. Like all these like really important people are like freaking out that this is happening. And the lawyers are like, okay, look, we turns out isn't on the list of banned substances for the IOC. That's why you tested positive three times and you never heard about it because it wasn't triggering a red flag because it's not on the IOC list of banned substances. But it is on the FIS list of banned substances, the Ski Federation from the World Cup Tour, which we knew that and assumed it was the same for the IOC and it probably was an oversight and it should have been. Anyways, since then they've added weed to it. I'm the reason why Shikari is in trouble again last year because of, you know, anyway, it was just wild, right? So they're like, okay, it's gonna be fine. You're gonna get it. But the cops are like, no, well, this has been open, an open case and now we have to close the case. You have to come up to the police station, right? And so they actually put me in jail and were processing me under um, importing a controlled substance into Japan in, in my body, right? 
And so even though the lawyers told me that this is what's going on, the official decision hadn't been made. They just said, this is what their discovery is, right? Meanwhile, I'm in jail now. And I've been separated from the Canadian Olympic Association members and the RCMP guy that was with me and everybody. I'm in jail and they're in the lobby of the police station and I'm in jail and I'm being interrogated for hours and hours about cannabis. Meanwhile, I haven't really slept in, I don't even know like how many days that I really slept well or ate very well because I just came to Japan, 21 hour time difference. I've been like around the world just recently prior to that in Europe and competing in North America. And I've got three different time zones and I just competed at the Olympics, right? So I'm just like fried. And probably two hours into the interrogation, I said, I'm done. And um, so they left me in the, in the room there. And then they came and got me and told me that uh, they awarded me my medal back and then they couldn't keep me in the jail anymore because it was going to be too political to keep a gold medalist in the jail and I like walk out of the jail into the lobby of the hotel and all the, everyone there is cheering you know because it was just broadcast on whatever radios they had right and um, yeah so then the cops wanted to go to the hotel and search my room just literally a thousand snowboarders from the world cup tour were there booing the cops throwing shit like they were it was it was a major scene right so they finally the dogs went in the room and they searched everything and obviously everything checked out um you know i got a, the next day in the athletes village i went in and i got a standing ovation you know Crazy stuff, guys. Hey, like I went to watch Wayne Gretzky play, like where he didn't get to take the shot and everything. Like I got a couple of chances to, to talk to Wayne and everything. But then I walk into my room after the next day and my phone's ringing. No, this was literally right after the cops left. Bef before that, that day, the cops were in my room. They left and I'm left in my room finally by myself after all this craziness and media like hanging onto the car the hood of the car with cameras and the flashes and my phone's ringing in my room i'm like there's no way like who's calling me in japan right and so i let it ring like 20 times but it wouldn't stop ringing so i picked it up it's my buddy from whistler he's like jay leno wants you on the tonight show day after tomorrow right and i'm like no way it's unreal, right? And then the next day I went down to to see the Olympics in Nagano and I was like the superstar because I won and then I lost and then I won. Just people knew who I was, it's like Japanese people, the kids, right? It was nuts. I flew to LA the next day and I was staying at the Beverly Hilton. Porsche had a car for me, waiting for me at the Beverly Hilton. I had like cigars in my room people were like leaving like baskets of presents and shit like that and you know just the craziest thing then i did jay leno the next day you know snl did skits on me david letterman did skits on me you know i ended up going on conan o'brien like three times um Mike Bullard show, which was a big show back in the day in Toronto. I was like a regular guest on the Mike Bullard show. Anyway, I mean, things just blew right up after that. And um, the problem was, though, I was broke. As a Canadian athlete and going to the Olympics, like, I actually had to pay a little bit of money to go to the Olympics, right? And but I was like wicked famous, but I had no job and I wasn't making any money. And they're like flying me around to Toronto and shit. I'm like, I can go for lunch unless someone took me for lunch. Right? It was insane. Like the life that I fell into after the Olympics. And then it was so intense that I really couldn't compete anymore. And I ended up having to retire at that point. And then I got on the no fly list after 9-11 because of the cannabis. And so I had been on the no fly list since 2001. And so by the time 2012 rolled around, I have like a baby girl. She's, well, I've got three kids now, but at the time I had 
I just had a baby girl, my second kid. My wife and I were packed up in the car with the dog and everything. We're gonna go down to Palm Springs where my mom lives in the winter. And then she can see the baby and stuff like that. And the border denies me, right? And so we have to turn around from the border. Wife's crying, right? Baby's crying. We have a long drive back to Whistler from the border, not to mention like the prep that we did to just get ready for the trip. And that was like 2011 or around 2012. And that's when I was like, you know what? Fuck this shit. Like I've lost everything that I would have wanted to guard as far as wet cannabis, um, prohibition and the stereotype and the stigma. Like I was trying to avoid all of that, but obviously for nothing, because now I can't even go to the States. This is all like coming back to me. I'm like building houses as a carpenter. I can't get a job doing anything because parents don't want me like around their kids and stuff like that. And um, that's when I started the Ross Gold Company because I'm like, that's it. Like, what, what more can I lose by starting the Ross Gold Company? So in 2012, we papered it up. We went through the whole like, rise up to legalization i had like a line of glass we did, we had a store open in Kelowna for two years um i was really really putting my neck on the line for the industry to say like look i'm not just jumping the bandwagon i have a dispensary also with my name on it pre-legalization i've got my glass came out the same week that tommy chong got let out of jail for having glass right and so i was like really like sick and tired of what was going on with me and in, in my life and what the fallout from the Olympics was like here I am smoking a joint with Keith Richards backstage at the Rolling Stones concert in Denver broke partying with uh, um, you know crazy known people like broke that's what I was thinking I, I remember opening a root store in Soho New York with Michael and Don from Roots and partying with Dan Aykroyd and all the supermodels that were there for the Roots thing and smoking joints with those guys and broke as fuck. No money until around 2008. And then there was a period of time where I was on the no fly list. All the fuss from the Olympics was dying down a little bit. I was dealing with PTSD from the whole experience. Um, you know, this is, I'm still like getting interviewed by the national, like how amazing is it to be a gold medalist? I'm like, it's fucking rad. Like, I love it. So awesome, Canada rules. Like I love my supporters. But at the same time, I'm like broke. I don't have a job. I can't. As a known person, it's hard to have a tool belt and walk onto a job site and look for work. Like your ego starts getting in the way of reality, right? And I want to be like coaching snowboarding or I still want to be at the X Games. Like this is early on, like in the times where I would have been at the X Games, but I can't go to the States, right? And all this fucking shit. And so I started the Ross Gold brand. Uh, we rose up through the whole prohibition and into legalization. And so since legalization, we had to shut everything down, right? because we were already operating in the gray market. And um, so we have yet to emerge in the new market. You can see where I am now. I'm in a huge friggin' facility. We've got 10,000 square feet of canopy and we're growing uh, living soil. We're certified organic. I'm actually growing the plants myself with a, a team, obviously. And um, yeah, the Ross Gold brand's about to live again and I'm growing. Yeah, I'm not just like branding weed, guys. I'm not just jumping the bandwagon like Martha Stewart or whatever. Um, I'm actually like growing this stuff and it's the best. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't change anything though. Um, you know, a lot of good has, has come from it. And I was given a, this huge platform in 1998 to speak out on behalf of cannabis and cannabis users. And, you know, I did that at every opportunity. And, you know, like when Michael Phelps, I don't know if you guys remember Michael Phelps a few years ago, I can't remember, like five or six or seven years ago. Um, I was the guy on NBC that talked, to it, you know, to the, the, the users and said, why would Michael Phelps use cannabis? I will tell you, it's 
zero calories, zero fat, go to sleep early, wake up early, you know, be motivated, be yourself. Like there's so many great things about it. Why an athlete would want to, you know, use cannabis. And so I was up against the guy that was like, well, if that's the case, then why is it that, you know, there are more people in cannabis rehab than any other drug. And I'm like, well, in America, there's a mandate where if you get busted for weed, you have the option to go to jail or go to rehab. And he had nothing to say about that. You know, the, a little bit of the backstory and, you know, the whole thing with me going to Nike, they totally disappeared after the drug test thing came out, like off the face of the earth, right? Com like it never happened. And that's the way the corporate nature of the world was with regards to cannabis, right? Like at the time they couldn't touch that. And um, now they've got the Nikes with the weed leaf on them and stuff like that. But, um, you know, at the time it was, it was tough, but it's come full circle, right? Like I'm working with OVO. I don't know if you guys noticed that the Eaton Center, I'm on the fucking window of OVO and like five different television sets. Like, um, you know, so I've, you know, been able to like stay relevant through the whole cannabis thing and not just be like, like I said, like I had the store, I had the merchandise and stuff like that, but I've been growing weed too for the last like, number of years, right? Like I, I started working with weed before the Olympics, right? So this is like over 25 years of me knowing how to work with weed. And now I'm finally in the licensed facility. Um, it's called Green Mountain Health Alliance. You probably saw from my Instagram, but, um, so we are just now putting together the whole Ross Gold package. I have a processor that's um, submitted my Ross Gold Indica Sativa and hybrid um, names to the whole Health Canada thing. So those are gonna be my three strains. What's gonna happen is on the container, there's gonna be a batch number that you enter when you go to our website and you enter that batch number and then you can see what strain it is and you know you can see pictures of me growing that particular batch and so it's not going to say what it is you're going to just get ross gold indica but then you look on the bat on the thing and then you plug in the batch number and then you can see me working on the plants there's going to we're going to do all kinds of like fun stuff where there'll be like live video you can just look at the greenhouse and see the plants moving in the wind and it just adds to the whole like experience of when you go to the dispensary and you buy like a Ross Gold pre-roll and you know okay so Ross was actually growing this we're gonna go on the computer right now and look here it, here he is on the phone growing the weed right now and so it's just like cool man I'm just pumped to be able to make that connection of touching the weed and then having people like it's like a connection to me right and, and the story and there's like so much behind the brand Yeah. So, um, yeah, Ali and I met probably, I think we're going on 12 years now. And um, at the time, you know, there was a little bit of an age difference between, there still is, but, um, you know, she was at least young enough to be not stigmatized the way us older guys had been during Prohibition. And so she had the ability to sort of actually see the benefits of cannabis rather than the stigma and the stereotype of cannabis the way most people would see it and um so right away that was that was great because in a relationship obviously you need to be able to be yourself you know for their relationship to work and you know me um being allowed to smoke weed by my girlfriend or whatever it was like a big deal right like it wouldn't have worked any other way so you know so that was number one you would think that's a no-brainer, but, it, it, you know, sometimes you get in a relationship and everyone's like, it's cool, it's cool, but then later it's not cool anymore. So this was a different situation where I was supported by my wife um, and, you know, it was a little bit of a gray area. We didn't really know what we were getting into at the time. Probably wouldn't have done it if we would have known all the crazy stuff that, you know, was going to come of it. But that's the beauty of being naive about stuff, you know, and trying to do stuff that is big um, can be a big picture thinker and um, not know like how many details are going to come about so we just kind of kept the big picture as our target and 
yeah i mean just the fact that ali would say yeah go ahead and um you know do the brand like when we first met i i said to her you know there's a few things i want to talk to you about because that might impact like what you want to and i was old enough to know at the time like this was an important conversation that we had to have like she was 23 i was 38 right and so we had that conversation right away she's like yeah i think that's a great idea you you're the best guy that I could think of, like, you know, with the best story, that like, you should definitely do that. And that was it. I mean, that was the number one thing I needed to hear, you know, and, uh, you know, from your partner was, you know, that they support it. And so from there, it just snowballed. Um, I got interest right away from the media. I was able to, um, you know, get the brand out and get brand traction with very minimal um, cost just because the media helped me helped me to accomplish that and then later on like social media and um, yeah so that was that was pretty much it um, obviously you know we I've got three kids and having that family and then the balance between starting up a brand in the cannabis sector and when you're still not really making money and you're building houses at the same time to pay the bills there's a lot going on right and um you know i'm doing interviews on the side and projecting like an image of success and you know everything but at the same time i'm like okay i don't know how i'm gonna pay my phone bill next month right so there's like this balancing act of following your dreams but dealing with reality at the same time so yeah family was a big part of you know keeping my act together Yeah, I do actually think cannabis can put you in the moment and can be performance enhancing in certain ways. Um, you know, when we hear the word performance enhancing, it, it kind of is stigmatized in itself, right? Because it's always associated to like anabolic steroids or something. Like that. But in reality, like a banana is performance enhancing, right? Water is performance enhancing. You will fucking die if you don't drink water. And so, there's a lot of things that are performance enhancing that we don't necessarily consider performance enhancing. And cannabis is one of those things. Um, it helps me in particular, like I'll just speak to my own experience, but when I was leading up to the Olympics, prior to the drug testing and everything, um, some of the older guys that I was, because I was the young guy coming onto the tour, right? And the older guys were smoking weed on the chairlift and like going through the training course. And I'm like, really? You guys are getting baked right now? And they're like, yeah, man, it's awesome. You can really like feel your equipment and notice things that you don't know, no, you normally notice. And so I'm like, oh, because I was already smoking weed, but I would always wait until after training. And then they're like, no, no, here, have a have a puff. So I have a few puffs. We smoke a joint together, and then we and on a pro team, you pay the coach. He works for you, right? So I'm not worried at this point that I'm smoking weed. Like the coach works for me, right? So there's no one, I'm not gonna get in trouble by anybody or anything like that, right? I was just not smoking weed because I thought it was something that I would do after, you know, training or whatever. Turns out it's great to smoke weed and then say run a race course. There's so much feel that goes on and there's so many different things that are happening that you don't notice when you're not baked on your, like the angle of your bindings, how tight your boots are, how hard the snow is, all these other things. There's a lot of things that you don't notice um, on a regular. And then when you, you smoke a little bit, I'm not talking about getting completely wasted here either, guys. I've got a huge tolerance, right? So when I smoke a, a joiner, I'm not really like stoned, like the classic sense of the word. But, um, and so when I found that out, I used, I used cannabis a lot for different things like that. So whether it was working out in the gym, um, I found that it gave me the motivation to um, go to the gym for the 10,000th day in a row, you know, like when it's pouring rain out and it's early and cold in Whistler and it's just better to stay inside, have a bong rip and get out and go to the gym and get your workout done and then come back and relax. 
And so that was the motivation that kept me in the gym on a regular basis and training and going on these long mountain bike rides. So I grew up in, in Vancouver and I moved to Whistler, but the guys I lived with in Whistler were pro mountain bike racers. And they were all doing like fucking acid and going mountain bike riding. They were smoking joints and going mountain bike riding. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Right? Like, I can't even believe like you guys. And so the next thing you know, it's like, oh, they stop for a joint every two hours and you get back on your bike and you feel 100% like you never even went on a bike ride yet. And so all of these things are starting to dawn on me like, oh, I can increase my cardio so much more easily with cannabis. It, it doesn't even seem like hard work anymore. And so there was just a lot of realization about, you know, how to combine cannabis and training. Um, of course, during events like World Cup events and the Olympics, when you have TV cameras and public, it, cannabis is just not conducive to that sort of environment. So you just naturally don't want to smoke weed during a race. Um, training, yes. Race, no. Also, like, at the time, I had to convince myself, like, this was healthy because I had a drinking experiences that weren't healthy and I had a, eventually decided that I wasn't drinking anymore. And, but there was no, nothing to back up my healthy feeling of when I used cannabis. And so I really had to like be like, okay, I've been smoking weed for 10 years. I've won lots of World Cups. I've accomplished all of my goals. I'm healthier than anybody I know, right? You know, what gives? Like I'm 51 years old, right? And people do not realize that when they first meet me. And I'm like, I don't know. Well, in some respects, it's better, and in some other areas, it's the same, right? So, for example, the better part is that you're allowed to have a thousand times more THC in your system now than you were when they added THC to the list after me. So that's good. So you're actually allowed a thousand times more in your body than you were then. So that, and it's still not very much, right? Obviously. Um, so that's good that they're they're realizing that some people in the world have more cultural exposure to cannabis than other parts of the world. And that some athletes like Shikari, well, not like Shikari because she smoked weed on purpose, but like a lot of athletes are exposed to it, but weren't necessarily using it. And so that was coming up in drug testing and they wanted to get rid of that. Um, CBD has been allowed at the IOC as far as the IOC is concerned. And so that's a great um, a natural anti-inflammatory and anti-anxiety medicine. Like what more could an athlete ask for, right? And so th those are good things. And I think um, stories that are continuing to come out like Shikari last year, um, Richards and, um, you know, the UFC fighters that are using it, speaking to who are the great athletes of the world, like Michael Phelps, most awarded Olympian in history. Who are these people? They're cannabis users. All the best ones, all the best athletes are cannabis users. Hussein Bolt, right? Oh, he smokes weed too. Oh, no shit, right? Fastest man on earth, right? So uh, it's pretty, it's ironic, right? That it, there's this movement or that there has been this movement over the years and, and for it to not be completely accepted. And I think the IOC at this point is, is it's a missed opportunity for them to be leaders in, because what they always do is speak out on on behalf of human rights and equality and this and that but they're not doing it in this case there's there, there's a big opportunity for them to really like lead be leaders um and and to not just promote like the physiological and psychological benefits of cannabis but to get behind like industrial uses of cannabis they could have venues built with hempcrete instead of concrete Right, like they could be using a more environmental approach also besides the physiological approach to cannabis to their benefit. And I think, you know, they really should be doing that. So at this point, it's almost irresponsible based on the medical evidence and the, the, the studies for them to not do that at this point. Much like in 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, are going to be way more likely to try cannabis on a whim and not have these social things going on in the background like oh I, won't, I might get fired from my job or I might not get my you know whatever we used to worry about.
right? That's right. I mean, the, the seniors know more than anybody because they've taken more big pharma than anybody else. And the ones that have been successful with cannabis have literally put aside dozens of bottles of pills for a plant. And they're, they're the most astonished out of everybody because they're the ones that um, believed in big pharma and were fed big pharma since they were babies. And without question, like they didn't question it. And, um, you know, big pharma, basically you can trace big pharma's birth to the beginning of prohibition, right? Because before, I mean, you know, probably I'm not, I'm not telling you this, but I'm just saying for our interview, like before prohibition, cannabis oil was in almost all the medicines. It was the base of medicine, basically. And then they would add different herbs for whatever specific thing it was that you had, but it was cannabis oil that was the common denominator in all the medicines. And then prohibition came, boom, big pharma just took advantage boom just like ran with it right and now look at what's going on there's like giant companies being sued for producing like oxycontins and and lying about it right and feeding it to us like like it was candy especially the athletes yeah i guess for them if they're in professional sports, knowing what the rules are in their sport, say a pro mountain biker where they don't have pro or uh, drug testing, or be some other sport where there's no drug testing, but you're just wondering like how that might affect you um, performance wise, and you're not a cannabis user, then, you know, I would say, you know, start, start tiny, start small. Because one joint's like equivalent of, of drinking a bottle of vodka if you don't know what you're doing. Like you can do the X Games, for example, and not be tested, drug tested, right? But you can't do the Olymp you can't go to the Olympics and not be drug tested. But it's easy to quit weed for a few weeks before you go to the Olympics, right? Like, like when I went to Europe and stuff, like the first few years, I didn't know anybody there, you know? But then after six years of going to the same resorts every year and getting to know everybody on the World Cup tour, we were connected like heavy duty in every country. like. The guys would come to Whistler and they were never seen BC but before they'd be laid out, right? And you know, we'd go to Austria and we'd get connect hooked up, go to Italy, get hooked up, and Switzerland, one of the only countries in Europe you can get flour at the time. You could go to the drugstore in Switzerland in the early nineties and buy a scented bag. And a scented bag was a long like baguette style bag with a branch of weed in it. And you're supposed to like light it on fire and like, like incense, right? So we were just going to the drugstore buying these scented bags, like full on in Switzerland, right? We couldn't even believe it. They didn't even know what they were selling. Each country had its own border and each country had its own money, right? And so now that the EU is there, you don't, there's no borders to go through. You can travel around without being stopped. But at the time when we were competing, you had to stop at each border and show your passport. And so we got like really freaked out about it and we started stashing weed in different countries. And so we had this one castle in Italy that was abandoned. And so we would stash weed inside this abandoned castle, like in the woods, go into Austria where our hotel was and do our racing and shit like that. And then after dinner, we would drive back into Austria to the abandoned castle and go in there and get baked inside this castle and then leave all the weed and shit there and then go back to our hotel in another country, Austria or whatever. I can't remember exactly what country it was, but another time we were, we were, we went through the border and then the border was at the entrance of a tunnel. So when we were in the tunnel, I started rolling a joint because I felt like we just went through the border. But what it was is we were just leaving a country and the border for the next country was in the middle of the tunnel. I'm like, fuck, there's dogs, there's border, there's cops, there's lights. I'm like rolling a joint in the rental car while somebody's driving. And we look up and it's like, we see German shepherds, everything. We're like, oh, weed in the back with all the suitcases, just like, like that. And uh, it was, you know, another time we're like smoking a joint outside a bar in Austria. And all of a sudden two snowboarders roll up with police badges. They're not snowboarders after all. They're they're busting World Cup guys 
smoking weed. And so I end up in the police station in Austria. Anyway, just crazy like stuff like over the years that happened, right? With weed and, you know, just all kinds of stupid shit. Meanwhile, you're like competing on the World Cup tour, like spending hundreds of thousands of sponsorship money, partying at different resorts, having a blast, doing like the best thing you could imagine, right? What we're producing out of the out of Green Mountain Health Alliance is um, we do fresh frozen for extract and we do flour. The only thing that we do here is we grow it. We either send it to them as dry flour or fresh frozen flour. And so they have the option of doing what they want with it after that. Um, and so like as far as like CBD and THC and topicals and um, sublingual stuff and perform, you know, stuff for athletes and things like that. That would all happen like later on in in the process with different processors that that we would work with. Um, so I, we are getting pre rolls um, done right away. Uh, the Roscoe brand is looking like um, I know that we're able to start selling in October, but I don't know if we're gonna have our packaging and everything else like all of that in a row, but we do have the, those brand names submitted to Health Canada and we're legally allowed to, to start moving Roscoe product in October. So if everything goes right before Christmas, hopefully there's some Roscoe free rolls and you can actually smoke a Roscoe fatty for Repliati, um, uh, hopefully before Christmas. But at the very latest, first quarter of next season, we should start seeing um, that. Probably the number one thing is how much work it is to grow this. I don't think the consumers realize the amount of manpower, person power um, that it takes to grow weed. And so there's that, um, like a gram of weed takes a lot of effort. Weed though, like I'm proud of the work that we do. Um, generally, people are coming around to the idea that you can have a very fairly functional, you know, high fun lifestyle and and be a stoner at the same time that was a big misconception and i think that's slowly um going away we're gonna find more out about it as far as science the science of it is concerned and how we are able to um effectively use like more effectively use cannabis i know for a fact that once we figure out like some of the nano capabilities of of cannabis and how we can get it into you and an effective dose where you don't have to build up for so long and you're not going to get so high from it that you can have an effective dose. Um, so these are all exciting things that are coming and I, I think probably the general public isn't aware of how exciting this all is and how many opportunities there are basically with, with cannabis and also on the industrial side. Like I'm a big promoter of industrial cannabis and what we can do is building fireproof houses and things like that. And we're dealing with that in British Columbia. Um, the town my dad grew up in burned down last summer, Lytton, BC. And um, so we're in the middle of presenting a hempcrete option for that community to see if we can get funding to do one or two houses out of hempcrete and um, really showcase like with a metal roof, like how fire resistant this structure really is. And not only that, but it keeps the heat in in the summer and, or in the winter and the cold out in the winter. And it's just a great, you know, thing. So there's all those, those things, probably a big misconception there too, is how much we can actually use cannabis and the oil from the cannabis to, um, in our daily lives. Um, I recently just heard that there's MDMA derived from cannabis. And so, you know, that's new to me. And you can make fuel for your car out of cannabis oil. So there's that, you know, everyone's going electric, but there's going to be a lot of engines sitting around. Maybe there's an opportunity to like not buy an electric car brand new and recycle an old fossil burning fuel car, but feed it cannabis instead, right? It's really cool and um, way more environmental. And, and right now in the building industry, there's a worldwide shortage of sand, which is what we use to build, 
use you know in concrete right so uh yeah it's time to start thinking differently and doing things differently like we don't have any more time to like just talk about it well i do uh i do a bunch of like i train people here at the greenhouse like on how to work on the plants and um so when we bring in people like sometimes they're skilled at, with cannabis and sometimes they're not so there's that um i'm constantly smoking weed so they all can tell that that's that works for me and maybe you know that's something that they could think about or maybe it's something that they didn't think about um so just like just the people i'm around i'm constantly like just i'm an example of what you know someone who uses cannabis like could be like and we kind of try to project that into the brand like over covid like i did so many big podcasts actually like out of los angeles and stuff and um you know i did the montel williams podcast i did um some really wild like snowboard talks i'm like this athlete guy too right so i get like these opportunities to do like vintage snowboard podcasts and talk about the good old days people don't know snowboarding wasn't allowed at one point like people ask me like how come you started snowboarding at 15 like isn't that kind of late right and i'm like well it, it, by today's standards it is but we weren't allowed to do it the, the year before that so um yeah there's just a lot of like things with cannabis and just general society that were kind of growing up together and um i had a company and the slogan it was a different company called legacy that i don't have anymore and the slogan for that was it's a growing lifestyle the company is gone now and there was a lot of ups and downs man like i can't explain like all, all the different things that happened but um it was a growing lifestyle and it literally was about growing but also because the cannabis lifestyle is also becoming more popular and so it was it was a cool thing and it it really is a growing lifestyle like my clothing line that we're coming out with is going to be like a kind of a first layer that you could throw on your ski jacket or your snowboard suit over it and then go snowboarding so you work on the plants in the morning with your first layer like sports yoga stuff basically right and then go snowboarding in the afternoon or go skiing later after you worked on the plants and you can just wear the same the same stuff so i hope that we can work out something with ovio i'm hoping that they they want to work with me i did a clothing line with them last year and that's why i'm on the window of their stores right now in the eden center you should go check it out so ovio's drake clothing line so that was a great experience you know i went to la during covid and um OVO like regolded my metal, like put new gold on it somehow. I'm like, how the fuck are you going to do that? There's shit on it that's not gold. And they're like, don't worry, we make 100 million dollar shit for rappers. Like, don't worry about it. And so it was just incredible. It was a famous photographer and yeah, you should check it out. It's, you can just go online and check out OVO and then my name. I would just be for the acceptance of cannabis to progress like for to see the the states go federal with it so that we can actually do cross border business with the states and bring like some of our our brands down there and bring some of your brands up here it would be cool um to share like the knowledge and like to share the flower amongst ourselves i think would be great um there's a lot of like know how here in British Columbia as far as growing weed goes but there is also in northern California and also like there's just hot spots right around North America where there's good weed and to be able to like come together i know we, like at in Vegas we we come together and we do like the the bigger shows together and, but we're not really able to like share the cannabis and um you know be a part of that because of the the federal nature of it be like Canada's first G8 country to go, to legalize cannabis at a recreational level that's great but it's not a huge influence like it would be if America did it and then once if America can do it that'll lead the way for all of Europe to to do it also and then you start getting countries like Japan that had a cannabis culture 1000 years ago 
that's been suppressed by the U.S. laws because of the huge relationship between Japan and Canada because of the Second World War and everything. There's so much politics wrapped up in weed for some reason. Like there's like whole race thing, right, with weed and prohibition, and there's like big pharma and companies like DuPont lobbying the U.S. government to keep weed illegal or to make weed illegal so they can corner like the rope and sale industry. Like there's just so much corporate interest in not having weed legalized that needs to come apart so that the corporate interest in legalizing weed can exist and we can like get these solutions to the problems that we're having solved, a lot of them through the different uses of cannabis and hemp. I'd be able to like launch my my flower into the into the space in in Canada after 25 years since Nagano and, and this whole it basically was one of the main catalysts of legalization in Canada was the fact that I was successful in winning the gold medal at the Olympics at a, at the highest level of sport and was able to speak to it on TV like in the media in a way that people it resonated with people. And for 25 years, it was a conversation that people had until the point where people were running on a platform of legalizing, legalizing cannabis. When it gets on the bill, like when it gets on the ticket and it's like, you're gonna get elected or not, that's when politicians start noticing and start reacting. And when, that's, when that happens in the States, There'll be a pivotal, a pivotal moment where one of the presidents or president-elect will realize that they can win the election if they legalize weed. When that happens, that's that's when it's going to happen. As soon as they realize that they win the election because of that. But they don't want that to be the reason why they're going to win the election right now. They want a million other things to be the reason. We don't even need to touch any of that. But you know from from the canadian perspective like we have um reporters from around the world that are in our ears giving us a perspective on what's going on and so it's very easy for us to look in from the outside and see what's going on but much more difficult if you're there to realize what's going on because you're not hearing those perspectives and so it gets tricky when it comes to like cannabis and politics and countries and the whole the whole thing right and that's how the ioc is all it's so tricky with them because they're constantly dealing with these all these different countries and all of their laws that they have so um and the whole corporate nature of of the olympics isn't conducive to cannabis either like i've done articles like in kind magazine is a magazine in canada that goes into all the dispensaries because it's a 19 plus space and so this is where you can do your advertising in this magazine so i'm a writer for kind magazine um last went last year when shikari um got in trouble i wrote a piece um it i think the caption was let the olympians smoke weed and but there was a really good story there and um so I'm always trying to like, you know, get out there and whether it's in print or in on the internet or social media or whatever to try to like bring light to all this stuff.